All right, excellent. Thank you all for joining. I'm sure we'll have some more people trickle in, but um, we will just begin and then everyone will catch up. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today and welcome to the latest installation of our ABNY talk series, ULERP. I'm Sarah Samuels, ABNY's Communications and Programs Manager. Please feel free to reach out to me or the ABNY team with any questions. You can reach us through email or social media at a better NY. Richard Barth and Susan Hinkson Carling, group leaders for the Capolino and Company's land use, housing, and real estate team, will walk us through an overview of the Uniform Procedure, or ULERC. We're in great hands with our speakers today. Richard Barth has more than 30 years of experience in land use planning, public policy, and community development. At Capolino and Company, he has facilita facilitated a broad range of residential, mixed use, and economic development projects private and not-for-profit clients on zoning, land use, housing, and real estate development issues and strategies. He serves on the board of Citizens Housing Planning and Development Council and was recently selected by D50 Distinguished Leaders. Formerly, he served as the executive director of the New York City Planning Department. Some of his notable achievements include guiding the creation of the Hudson Yards District, amendments to the theater subdistrict, and is working Greenpoint Williamsburg to reconnect the neighborhood to the waterfront and promote mixed income housing, among many more projects in all five boroughs. Before coming to Capolino and Company, Susan Hinkson Carling served as the vice chair and commissioner of the New York City Board of Standard and Appeals, where she heard and educated zoning variances, special permits, and administrative appeals cases. She also served as the Brooklyn Borough Commissioner for the New York City Department of Buildings, enforcing the New York City Zoning Resolution and Building Code. As Deputy Commissioner of the Planning and Community Development for Sullivan on numerous community development in initiatives. Earlier in her distinguished career in public service, she served as the Capital Program Manager for the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, administering design and construction contacts for the city, city's cultural institutions. Susan holds two law degrees from New York Law School and is a registered architect in New York. She also sits on the Board of Trustees of Wave Hill and is a trustee of New York Law School. We are honored to have both Richard and Susan here with us today. Please put all of your questions in the chat function throughout the presentation and we will address them at the end. Without further ado, Richard and Susan. All right, Sarah, thank you so much. And thank you, Abney, for hosting this event. Uh, it's a very timely event given everything that's happening or not happening with ULERP today. And I'm pleased to be joined by Susan and hopefully we'll be able to demystify ULERP, one of the most ubiquitous acronyms in the uh, city's land use, uh, land use world. I think it rivals that of SEEKER. So we will try to answer your questions and, and explain the process and how it's used. The next slide, please. So ULERP, uh, well, let me start by saying ULERP, um, that most development in the city occurs on an as of right basis. Uh, if a piece of property development complies with zoning, uh, they go to the uh, Department of Buildings and they get the permit. ULERP is designed for those, uh, it's, it's required in the city charter and designed to provide a more open and public land use review procedure for a specific set of zoning regulatory actions as well as other city actions. Um, you'll, hear more, you'll hear more later about the players in the ULA process, but very quickly, the primary stakeholders are the Department of City Planning, Community Boards, Borough Boards, uh, the Commission, and then the Borough Presidents and the uh, New York City Council. The Borough Presidents should actually be before the City Planning Commission. Uh, so we'll talk more about that later. Uh, the Department of City Planning is the entry point uh, for starting the ULERP process. And one goes through the department in order to start the formal seven month ULERP process. Next, please. Uh, so next slide, thank you, uh, Sarah. The, uh, just wanna spend a couple minutes on the evolution of ULERP. Uh, it was originally established by the city charter in 1975 and adopted through city planning commission rules in 1976. It was really intended to get away from a top-down master planning approach from Robert Moses in particular, and to provide a process whereby there would be more local input 
before final decisions on land use were made. Uh, 1989 charter changes, uh, these were the big charter changes and essentially is Euler as we know and love it today was adopted in 1989. And the big moves in 1989, it, uh, the city charter change, the, the charter was, a, adopt, was amended after the Board of Estimate was ruled unconstitutional. And the Board of Estimate uh, had been a body appointed to three citywide electeds and borough presidents, and they were the final arbiters on the land use review process. What the 1989 charter did was to shift that final authority on land use to the city council. And at the same time, the city planning commission was modified. So instead of being entirely appointees of the mayor, these were appointed by a mix of the mayor and other elected officials, keeping a mayoral majority. Uh, I put in the 2019 charter tweaks. I call it tweaks because uh, uh, the charter changes that were adopted last year were relatively minor as it affected the land use review process. It was important from a couple of respects. One was that there was a lot of debate calling for more land use comprehensive planning, investing more power in community boards and the borough presidents. What the Charter Commission ultimately decided was that the ULIP, as we know, it, is sound today and uh, relatively sound. And the only tweaks they did were relatively minor, but they kept the fundamental uh, pieces of ULIP as they were established in 1989. And as all of you may or may not know, we're currently in the midst of a ULIP pause. On March 16th, uh, Mayor de Blasio issued an executive order which basically froze everything in place. So. If something was at the community board, a land use application, or at the city planning commission, the clock stopped. And that's where we remain today. We expect to hear more this week from city planning about the restart of your, but it's our understanding that uh, they will start the, uh, they, the department and the city will restart your in September and may start some commission meetings as early as August. But we expect to hear more this week. Next, please. So, uh, as I said before, most development in New York City is as of right, and uh, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, it's a complex, it's a large city, and uh, in order to be able to um, um, uh, uh, grow and develop, it's important to have a set of zoning, zoning regulations in place to facilitate a wide range of development. However, uh, if one seeks to entitle property in a different way, there are a set of actions that, are re that must go through the zoning, uh, the Euler process. And specifically, uh, zoning map amendments, for example, changing from a manufacturing to a residential district, that requires a full Euler. There's a host of City Planning Commission special permits. They are all subject to Euler. These include uh, things like a special permit for an arena, it could be a large scale special permit to modify height and setback regulations. Uh, there might be special permits for more floor area, for example, in exchange for subway improvement bonus. Those all require specific discretionary review and approval by the city planning commission and the city council. And then there are a number of other city actions that are also subject to ULERP, uh, city map changes, site selection for capital projects, revocable consents like uh, bridges over streets and the sale of city property. These are all uh, actions specified in the city charter that require the full viewer process. Um, a very brief overview, but with that, I want to turn it over to Susan, who will talk about some of the other non viewer and other land use processes that affect our lives in the city. Thanks, Richard. So uh, there are um, sort of three basic uh, non ULERP, or maybe a better description would be modified ULERP actions um, that the CPC considers. Um, these actions, although not necessarily on the clock per se in relation to ULERP timing um, and the timing process, they are refer referred uh, to community boards and in some instances um, to the borough presidents for review as a practice. 
Additionally, the city council um, does not automatically necessarily review all non ULR type actions that are approved by CPC, but the charter requires that the council to review certain actions um, as a mandatory, um, mandatory action, some only under special circumstances um, and, and makes provision for the council to, um, to elect to review certain, certain actions. So uh, the first up, I guess, is a zoning text amendments. Uh, a text amendment is not necessarily subject to the prescribed timing. The planning commission can take its time or, or not as it sees fit. However, although not um, going through sort of the big ULERT process, the CPC does um, refer out an application to community boards and um, borough presidents simultaneously. Uh, the commission will hold public hearings um, uh, in, in due course. Uh, and the approved amendment um, does go to the city council for a mandatory review. Um, the city council has 50 days to act. Um, other actions that perhaps the city council is mandated to um, review and either approve or disapprove uh, are zoning map changes, zoning text changes that aren't subject to ULERT, uh, housing and urban renewal plans, um, disposition of residential buildings, except those going to nonprofits um, for low income housing. Uh, the council may elect to review certain actions um, and after the CPC files its report, uh, this review is, is known as a council call up. Um, also, if the community board and the borough president have disapproved of certain actions or if the CPC approves but modifies an application and the borough president filed an objection, um, the city council will take it up. Those are um, city map changes, maps of subdivisions um, uh, or what's known as a platting, uh, zoning special permits, um, revocable consents, franchises, um, non-city public improvements, sanitary and waterfront landfills, uh, disposition of commercial or vacant properties, uh, disposition of residential buildings uh, uh, or, or nonprofit companies for low income housing and acquisition of real property and site selection. Uh, the second type of action uh, is a zoning authorization and authorization modifies sort of specific zoning requirements um, if certain findings are met. Uh, no public hearings um, are, are held as a practice. The application is sent though to the appropriate community um, board um, for comments. An example of sort of an author authorization might be uh, modifications, let's say to height or a parking requirement to accommodate a store under what's known as the FRESH um, uh, program which is quite an interesting program. It provides greater access um, to fresh and healthy foods to neighborhoods that are underserved uh, by lowering the cost of leasing and developing um, a supermarket. So, so if, if you are developing that sort of use, um, you um, might um, want to be able to get a height restriction um, lifted in some way or um, not to provide as much parking uh, as zoning would have required, um, you can go to city planning and get an authorization. Um, third, uh, zoning certifications, which are uh, really sort of ministerial in nature as opposed to discretionary. Uh, discretionary actions require the exercise of judgment uh, and ministerial actions really involve uh, sort of verification of objective um, compliance with a law um, or regulation. So an example um, of that might be an authorization for uh, a parking waiver for uh, a, um, a house of worship uh, or a rooftop greenhouse or um, a nursing home. Um, if the council fails to act when it's supposed to um, within its specified review period, uh, it's somewhat deemed that um, that it has passed. So uh, uh, sort of have to be careful and make sure that, <laughs> that the city council acts uh, and in a timely manner. Um, next slide, please.
So um, the, part of the non ULARC process, uh, there are two agencies that handle land use actions uh, that somewhat fall outside of, of ULARC, uh, but nonetheless uh, are uh, a public process in some way. Uh, the BSA, uh, my old home, uh, the BSA is, is an obscure but powerful agency. Uh, uh, this refers to a New York Times article. And uh, I have to say that, that to this day, uh, if I'm sort of in a social situation, someone says, oh, there's Susan, she's obscure yet powerful. Uh, next slide, please. So I think we should maybe get a little bit of history on um, some of these agencies. So um, the Board of Standards and Appeals uh, is um, sort of governed by the um, zoning resolution, which is the legislation that um, en enables us to, to govern land use uh, in the city of New York. Uh, it's, um, the BSA fits into a, a much larger picture of, of land use in New York. Uh, so, you know, in response to unsanitary conditions and, and fire hazards and noxious uses being sort of butted up against one another uh, in the mid 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, in, in 1916, New York enacted the zoning resolution, which is, I believe the very first uh, zoning um, uh, law in the country. Uh, so therefore probably, I guess the oldest, uh, and, and it enabled the BSA uh, as a quasi judicial body to grant relief to landowners uh, whose property was unduly burdened by sort of a strict interpretation uh, of, of uh, the zoning resolution. Uh, the purpose was not only to grant um, relief in that regard, uh, it's also uh, is, is sort of a safety valve for, for the city uh, in that um, the purpose uh, would be to guard against claims of unconstitutional takings uh, of private property uh, by the city. So the BSA um, sort of has a, a dual role. Uh, it consists of, of five commissioners uh, appointed by the mayor and with the consent of city council uh, the city charter requires that no more than two commissioners can reside in any one borough, and there must be a, a registered architect on board. There's got to be a licensed engineer and also uh, a certified um, uh, planner as well. Next slide, please. So the BSA hears a variety of cases. Most common are zoning variances and appeals cases. Uh, this slide will show you the types of land use actions the BSA hears. Uh, and as I said, notably, um, variance cases are typically the, the most gnarly to prosecute uh, because of the standards are what we call findings um, that are required. It's a very rigorous review, um, usually involves architects and engineers, financial analysis, uh, environmental experts. Uh, so it, it can also be very costly to a landowner to, to prosecute a case at BSA. Uh, next slide, please. So additionally, um, there's a variety of special permits that the BSA uh, decides. Uh, but this is all a public process. I think that's the big takeaway. Uh, there's advisory input from borough presidents, from uh, council members, from other electeds, from community groups, uh, and, and just the community at large. But um, uh, as, as with other agencies, it's really up to uh, the commissioners to, to make uh, an independent uh, a decision. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, you know, the, the community gets very involved um, in public hearings and uh, it's, um, it's, it's really sort of the poster child, I think, for, for public involvement. Uh, next slide.
So next, um, the next agency that sort of an integral part uh, of the land use process uh, is Landmarks Preservation. Uh, so the LPC is responsible, I'm sure many of you know, uh, for the preservation and protection of architecturally, uh, cultural, uh, and historically significant structures, places, sites, uh, districts. Uh, next slide. And just a little bit, bit of history on, on landmarks. Uh, and I have my favorite photographs on this slide. Uh, landmarks was, uh, the Landmarks Law was enacted uh, in part, uh, very probably large part, due to the demolition of the old Penn Station, which was uh, a gorgeous, um, exciting space. Um, so in 1965, uh, Landmarks Law was passed and uh, which enabled uh, the LPC. And the mandate, of course, is, is to safeguard those types of spaces uh, like the old Penn Station uh, that have cultural and social, even economic or political um, significance in history. Um, and the LPC is the largest such agency uh, in the country with over 37,000 designations, uh, which is pretty interesting. Next slide. Great, so uh, it's back to me, uh, back to the Euler process. It's back to you, Richard, thank you. <laughs> uh, back to the Euler <laughs> process. And uh, just a few, this is a chart, I don't expect you to uh, um, take in this entire chart, but the, the key points here are, um, the Euler process itself, once an application is certified as being complete, is a defined seven month public review process. And that in fact is one of the benefits of Euler. It's the timing is predictable once you get to the starting gate. In order to get to the starting gate, there's a number of steps that one has to undertake. An applicant, whether it be the city agency for irrevocable consent or a private applicant, they have to go through a number of steps and able to, to enable to start the process. And the Department of City Planning is the gatekeeper and they determine when an application is complete. Next step, next slide, please. So um, when I was at city planning, um, I think the complaints we got most from applicants was the pre-certification process. And this process can extend for a long, long time. And uh, when I was executive director there, we went through a major process redesign to try to make the pre-certification process more predictable and have very specific steps to reduce the number of different loops and reviews and to have a, a real, you know, how you come into the department, what you have to do to reach certification. So the city planning has a great website which describes all these uh, steps. Uh, the first is an informational meeting, say at the borough office, say, here we are, this is what we'd like to do. The next step is a pre-application statement which describes in detail which is submitted after the informational meeting. It describes in detail what the project is about, what actions are re being requested. And then the department, the borough office, will pull together other divisions to sort through if there's any outstanding issues, if there's a better way of doing something. After that is done, uh, one, the applicant has to complete an environmental review. And this is another one of these famous acronyms, Reasonable Worst Case Development Scenario which is a, the applicants required to look at what is the future on this site under the current conditions and what could be done under the proposal. And the environmental review then looks at that incremental increase over what's being proposed. Um, and that, uh, that this is something that can be very time consuming. And finally, there's a draft application um, and that has, uh, depending on the type of action, there are different requirements for what that draft application includes. And the other piece is the environmental review. So whether it's a, um, a, a you know, depending on the type and the complexity of the application, it may be simply an environmental assessment, but it may trigger more detailed reviews on traffic, air quality, and if there's potential for significant impacts, 
an environmental impact statement would be required, which that in itself has a separate process to get to a draft environmental impact statement. Next slide. And uh, so uh, once all these steps are taken and, and this process redesign actually was incorporated into rulemaking by the city planning commission. So there's actually time frames that are attached to each one of those steps that I mentioned, but they can add up to 90 days, 45 days. It can extend to quite a long time in pre-certification, often longer than the actual land use review process itself. But once the department does its final review, determines the application is complete, we get to the starting gate and the Europe clock begins. Um, and we'll talk a little more about uh, the, the, how this translates into a real project. But for now, Susan will talk about those steps and the timeframes involved in each. Take it away, Susan. <laughs> Thank you. So as, as Richard said, um, the first phase, um, the pre-certification, um, sort of getting the application together can take um, some time and, and there isn't really a time frame for that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of give and take uh, and, and back and forth and uh, an original application can, can morph and be modified uh, to be able to get to the point where it gets certified um, uh, by, by city planning. But once it is certified, um, next slide, please. We get into phase two, and, um, and, and perhaps maybe I should be using, instead of phases, maybe it's, it's step two. Uh, but when that begins, uh, the local community board gets 60 days to review the application. Uh, and there are 59 community boards in the city. Uh, and as noted before, the community board recommendation is, is advisory. Um, next slide, please. Then um, uh, once you've gotten past uh, the, um, the community board step, you uh, get into step three, which is a review by the borough president. Uh, of course, there are five, five boroughs, five borough presidents, um, and comments from the particular um, uh, borough president uh, is, is given to uh, city planning um, for an, an advisory, uh, advisory position. Uh, and uh, once that's completed, next slide, please. You get into step four. And this is where um, I guess all of the, everything comes together and uh, the 13 member commission will consider the application uh, and will vote on its merits. Here the public weighs in um, on the application through public hearings and the commission can um, modify uh, the application during this stage uh, in response to public comments or commissioner concerns. And although community boards and the borough president's opinions are advisory, their feedback serves to um, inform not only the, the commission, but also inform the local council member. Uh, and I think this fact plays um, a large role in sort of the next step of the process. Next slide, please. So if the CPC votes to disapprove of uh, the application, uh, then sort of the process stops. Um, if the application is approved, then we move into step five uh, and the city council reviews the application. During this step, uh, the council holds public review and the council may modify the application, um, make some changes. Uh, they're permitted to do so as long as it's sort of within the scope of the work. Uh, that, that's been identified. Uh, and here's where perhaps the local council member uh, plays uh, a, a bigger role. Uh, uh, typically, there may be some deference uh, accorded to, to the um, council member, 
um, although not always. <laughs> um, the council takes its cue, perhaps, um, from the local member uh, in making um, uh, an approval or, or making some changes, uh, but takes into account uh, sort of the, the, local, um, the local member's feelings on, on the subject. Um, next slide. So step six, uh, and, and sort of uh, maybe sometimes where there is drama uh, in this, in this um, whole process, uh, but rarely, uh, the approval goes to the mayor uh, and the mayor has, uh, has veto power, um, and, but must do that within five days of the council's uh, uh, decision, uh, but, but it can go back to the council. Uh, and if the council chooses to override the veto, and it's got to do that with a two thirds majority, then um, they have 10 days to do that and uh, the application can be approved. Uh, so Richard, um, I think I've gone through all of the phases um, and I think you'll take us into a real life scenario uh, with an example of of how the process works on a real-life project. Thanks, Susan. So uh, La Hermosa Christian Church, and I'll, I'll go through this quickly because I know all of you have questions. Uh, Capilino was really pleased to be part of a team hired by the church that included Jamie Chell of Hudson Advisors, FX Collaborative, and Herrick Feinstein uh, Land Use Attorneys. And we work collectively for the church to advance a major rezoning for their site, which as you can see, this is the northeast corner of uh, 110th and 5th Avenue. It's the uh, uh, right on, on Duke Ellington Circle across from Schomburg Towers, where by, by the way, the council member lives, council member Perkins. Uh, but the church is a longtime anchor for Harlem cultural and religious life. And uh, unfortunately, like a lot of houses of worship, they face incredible capital expenses and needs, and they're unable to maintain their plan and continue with their, basically with their, their mission. Mm -hmm. What the church did here, and if you go to the next slide, please, was take a new approach. And this shows some of the, uh, where the church itself, it's right on the corner. It's an incredible site, right at Central Park and Fifth Avenue. And what the church, uh, um, did rather than what typically happens is the church may hire sell the land to a developer and the developer takes the application through the land use process the church made the decision to control its destiny and felt it could maximize its value greater by their being the applicant before a developer was actually hired uh, next slide please so what the church is seeking, and uh, it's uh, basically a zoning change to increase the density allowed on the site. The current zoning, it really was not uh, economically buildable to be able to meet a lot of the church's needs. Uh, there was also a text amendment to make mandatory inclusionary housing uh, part, mandatory, part of this application. And there were a couple of special permits, both to modify the height setback bulk regulations we refer to, the refer to the shape and the height of the building and to waive parking for the site. Uh, next slide, please. So the approved project, um, it was approved, is approved in December of uh, 2019. Uh, it will provide state-of-the-art uh, community educational space and new church facility. And uh, with the project approvals, there were bulk modifications to create a stronger civic presence on the circle, as well as uh, there were reductions in height that came out as, out of the public review process. Overall, the development will provide about 280 new, uh, new, mar new housing units, of which 25% of those will be permanently affordable housing. Next slide, please. So the ULERP review, uh, it was certified in May of 2019. Uh, it took us, and I say us collectively, the team, it took 15 months to go through that pre-certification process. 
So ULURP is really not for the faint of heart uh, because it takes a great investment of time and money in order to start the process. And then there's no predictable outcome at the end. And I might add during this kind of 15 month pre-certification period, uh, we always advise our clients to uh, take that time to brief the community, brief the elected, brief other stakeholders, brief the borough president, so they know about the project and they can have input into the project before ULERP starts. That being said, when we got to the community board, uh, the land use committee, which we had met with, uh, overwhelmingly endorsed the project, but the full community board actually issued a recommendation against it. And one of the things they raised was the fact that the church, they didn't have a developer that they could deal with directly. They were dealing with the church. The borough president issued a recommendation against the project, and uh, her concerns had to do with the scale of the project and also the fact that uh, she would have preferred much, much, much more affordable housing. At the City Planning Commission, there was a, a, it was a really good public hearing, and the department and City Plan and the applicant, FX Collaborative and all of us, worked closely to modify the application. So it brought down the height, it reshaped the building, and it made it much more uh, uh, palatable to uh, to how it meets the circle and to the scale of it. And the height, as I said, came down to about the height of Schomburg Towers across the street. When we got to the city council, um, and the city council did adopt it after their 50-day review period in December, um, and one of the changes that the council, um, one of the things the church wanted to do is use part of the funds from the um, sale of the, the, the church, of the development piece to fund the uh, free music program for Harlem uh, kids in Harlem. Uh, the church had, and uh, Councilman Perkins had different priorities. And ultimately that commitment was replaced by commitment to help, in addition to MIH, to help fund uh, uh, 300 units, uh, preservation units of affordable housing community district 10 in Harlem. So with that, those commitments, the project was approved in December of 2019. Um, so, you know, with the zoning entitlements now in place, the church is essentially a master of their own destiny, and they're in the process of selecting a developer so they can move forward with the development and then meet the commitments about their mission to serving the community, as well as their commitments to affordable housing. Uh, and with that, um, open to questions. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you both so much. That was wonderful and really so um, informative and we appreciate it. 